neurophysiology. There are four parts. Neurons, neuroglia, talk about neuron activity, a synapse from one neuron to another tissue, and neurotransmitters. We're going to look at the different types of neuroglia and neurons and basic neuron anatomy. A neuron conduct electrical impulses. There are three basic types of neurons. We have motor neurons, sensory neurons, and interneurons. Motor or efferent neurons send impulses out to the body. These signals control muscle cells, glands, and other tissues. Sensory or afferent sends impulses back up to the brain. And interneurons are interconnections within the brain and the spinal cord. We can see the sensory neuron in blue. Pricking a finger on a pin stimulates a pain receptor. That information goes to the spinal cord. In this case, to rapidly remove the finger from a pain source, an interneuron is needed, shown in yellow. To immediately activate the green motor neuron going out to the muscle to move the finger. From this side view, we can see the sensory neuron going to the spinal cord as well as up to the brain in blue. The interneuron connecting within the spinal cord and a motor neuron exiting the spinal cord in green. The three types of neurons we've just identified can also be classified by structure as unipolar, multipolar, or bipolar. Using the most common multipolar neuron, we can see the basic components. The cell body contains the nucleus and other organelles. Dendrites are projections that will receive a signal from another source. The axon is a single long projection that can conduct an electrical impulse. This impulse can only travel one way, which is away from the dendrites and toward the synaptic terminals at the end. The synaptic terminals can be referred to by several names, such as a synaptic bouton, which refers to the slightly enlarged end regions. The synaptic terminals or boutons contain chemicals that can be released. These are called neurotransmitters. There are many different types of neurotransmitters that are released from a neuron and target receptors on another neuron or a muscle or a cell or gland or just another tissue. This interaction is known as a synapse and will be discussed in its own section in this chapter. The unipolar sensory neuron is a little different where the cell body is off to the side along the axon. Dendrites are where various receptors are located to elicit excitation of the axon. Again, the axon sends its electrical impulse away from the dendrites and towards the synaptic terminals. Finally, the synaptic terminals will release their neurotransmitter to another neuron as a signal from this sense being detected makes its way to the brain for awareness and understanding. Neuroglia are considered to be support cells for the electrically conducting neurons. In the central nervous system, which is made of the brain and spinal cord, there are neuroglia that lines cavities or spaces within, forms a coating around parts of neurons such as myelin, and helps with connections and cleanup damage. In the periphery or rest of the body, satellite and Schwann cells provide support. The main neuroglial cell we'll focus on will be the myelin-producing Schwann cell. Myelin is formed around axons of neurons throughout the body. In the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, oligodendrocytes make myelin. One oligodendrocyte can connect to myelin sheaths with up to 60 different nerves. In the nerves that come out of the body, called the peripheral nervous system, the myelin is made by Schwann cells. There's only one Schwann cell for each myelin segment along an axon. Our focus regarding myelin will be on Schwann cells. They play an important role in increasing the speed of electrical impulses down an axon, called action potentials. They also protect neurons by electrically isolating them from each other. Within the periphery, as well as in the brain and spinal cord, these myelinated axons give a white appearance referred to as white matter. When a peripheral nerve is damaged along the a an axon, regeneration can occur. First, the po distal portion of the neuron dies. It's subsequently removed by macrophages. The end of the remaining portion of the axons begins to grow 
offshoots of axonal tissue. Adjacent swan cells regrow, providing growth-promoting chemicals and direct the growth trajectory. Regrowth can occur from one and a half to four millimeters per day. For damaged neurons in the brain and spinal cord, regeneration begins to occur but ceases after about two weeks. The oligodendrocytes do not function in a growth-promoting manner as the swan cells do in the periphery, so we don't have regrowth that occurs. Astrocytes promote scar tissue formation by halting any growth progress by the axon. Thus, nerve regrowth can occur to varying degrees depending on the damage, severity, and location in the periphery, but not in the central nervous system. You should be familiar with the types of neural tissue, the types of neurons, the anatomy of a neuron, myelin formation, location, and function, and the, how nerves are regenerated in the per periphery and the limitations in the central nervous system. Now we'll move on to neuron activity. To activate a neuron, several steps must take place. First, the neuron must be triggered to receive a stimulus. This trigger can be positive, making the neuron closer to activating, or negative, making the neuron harder to activate. If the cell body becomes more positive, then the axon can reach what's known as threshold and start an action potential, which is an electrical signal that travels down the axon terminal. At the axon terminal, it releases its neurotransmitter onto another neuron or other tissue like a muscle or gland to activate and stimulate that. In order to explain how these four steps occur, we need to go over some basic elements of a neuron cell membrane. To look at the basic components, let's zoom in and we'll see the plasma membrane of a neuron. Ions are basic components to make neurons work. Ions are charged particles. Two ions that we will focus on are sodium and potassium. Both are positive ions. There are a lot of sodiums outside the neuron and some inside. The gradient or direction they would want to travel if they could get across the membrane would be to go into the neuron. The high concentration outside causes the ions to want to travel to the lower concentration inside. Thus, the gradient for sodium is to enter the neuron. Potassium has a high concentration inside the neuron and a low concentration outside. The gradient direction that potassium would travel, if it could, would be to leave the neuron. This distribution, gradient of flow, and the effect of moving a positive charge into or out of the cell is very important to understand when we learn how a neuron functions and how we stay alive. Channels are there to open and close and either block or allow an ion's movement. Pumps are also there to put ions back after they go through channels to reset the balance. Let's look at how channels and pumps function within a cell membrane. A membrane channel is a protein that's embedded within the plasma membrane. Each ion has their own channel. It can be closed or open. When the channel is open, that ion is allowed to go through and will do so down its concentration gradient. There are several channel types which are classified on the mechanisms that cause it to open. Some membrane channels open when a certain chemical such as a neurotransmitter binds to the receptor. Each receptor is unique, so a specific chemical binds to only specific receptors. These are called chemically gated channels and are found on the neuron's cell body and dendrites where it will receive neurotransmitters from another neuron. Other channels open when the area adjacent to it reaches a certain voltage. The voltage level that opens a voltage gated channel is known as a threshold voltage. In this example, the incoming blue ions are positive more accumulated in the adjacent area of a voltage-gated channel. This changes the voltage sufficiently that it reaches threshold and it will open. The incoming positive blue ions in this channel causes the voltage to change even further in this area, enough that's going to ultimately activate the channel next to it. These voltage-gated channels are along the axon of a neuron. 
and it is the opening of one causing the opening of its adjacent neighbor occurring progressively down an axon. The channels are specific to an ion. The two we'll focus on for the neuron are sodium and potassium. Sodium ions are represented in blue and potassium in pink. Sodium is abundant outside of the cell. When sodium channels open, sodium will rush into the cell. This diagram shows the axon portion of a neuron and the influx of sodium causes the inside of the neuron to be more positive. Potassium is more abundant inside the cell. When potassium channels open, potassium exits the cell. Because potassium is a positive ion, its exit from the cell will cause the cell to become more negative. The chemically gated channels are found on the body and dendrites of a neuron. The chemical it receives is a neurotransmitter. There are several different types of neurotransmitters. The voltage gated channels are found along the axon where the voltage changes activate adjacent channels and then activate the one after that in a sequential fashion one direction down the axon toward the axon terminal. One interesting note is that the neurotoxin found in puffer fish will actually bind to voltage gated sodium channels. It is a blocker of that. And if it blocks that, action potentials are able to travel down the axon and the person will die due to paralysis, particularly the diaphragm where they can't breathe. So then we have membrane pumps. The pumps in a membrane require energy because they're moving these ions back against their concentration gradient to reset the balance. So the pumps restore the balance after the ions have gone through the channels. ATP is used to move these back into place. Because sodium is being moved against its concentration gradient, we'll need ATP for it to rotate and release it back. In actuality, the pump not only moves sodium out, but it also moves potassium back in at the same time. Both ions are moving and moved against their concentration gradients, thus needing ATP. This returns them to their proper balance. The ions across a membrane are very important for voltage. So we know outside the cell we have a lot of sodium and inside the cell we have a lot of potassium. Inside the cell, we also have a whole lot of negative proteins. So the voltage of a neuron at rest is minus 70 millivolt. So it's quite happy at minus 70 millivolt. When we open up channels and allow a lot of sodium to come in, we can bring this up from minus 70 up to zero and then farther up to plus 30 millivolts. So it's a range of 100 millivolts that can occur across a neuron cell membrane by just the influx of sodium. So membrane voltage is a term that quantifies the distribution of ions across the membrane. We can see here that there are more positive sodium outside in blue compared to inside. That makes the cell positive on the outside and more negative on the inside. Even after we consider the distribution of potassium in pink inside, there's still more than it is outside. The total distribution of positive is still far greater outside compared to inside. The actual voltage of a neuron at rest is called the resting membrane potential and it's at minus 70 millivolts. When sodium channels open, sodium enters creating a more positive environment in this area till it reaches plus 30. It then pauses the neighboring sodium voltage channel to open, being more positive, and once it reaches plus 30, the first one closes while the second one is still opening, causing the next one to open, bringing more ions in. That second one closes while this one continues to open. So we can we can see how it leapfrogs down an axon as one channel begins to open, the positive nature when it reaches its peak then closes the preceding channel.
So now let's go back to the step-by-step -step components of how a neuron transmits an electrical impulse. Starting from the initial trigger, dendrites receive a stimulus. The stimulus for a sensory neuron could be activation of a sensory receptor, such as pain, touch, or temperature. Most neurons, however, are more likely to receive a neurotransmitter from a neuron, which acts as a trigger. A neurotransmitter is a chemical, so a chemically gated receptor is on the dendrites for that neurotransmitter to bind to. The neurotransmitter is either positive, where the chemically gated channels for sodium will open, or negative, where potassium channels open or chloride channels open, making it harder to activate. So we see in this diagram a chemically gated sodium channel. The neurotransmitter binds to it, sodium is allowed to enter at the level of the cell body and dendrites, making it collectively more positive. This plus sign here at the end of the cell body is our first trigger for our voltage channels that are going to be along the axon. So we have these sodium gated channels open on the dendrites, making this cell more positive. This then triggers the voltage gated channels along the axon. It reaches minus 55. Remember, it started at minus 70. It reaches minus 55, and that's what's going to cause the sodium voltage gated channels in the axon to open. What happens at the level of the dendrites? In the last example, it was positive. A neurotransmitter comes that stimulates chemically gated sodium channels, causing sodium to enter, so collectively the whole cell body here becomes more positive. It goes from minus 70 at rest, and we can see this on the graph where it's just nice and flat at minus 70, and when sodium chemically gated channels are triggered to open, we can see it starting to go from minus 70 up towards threshold. Sometimes just a few channels open and it goes a little positive and then nothing really happens and it goes back to normal. Those are those failed initiations. But when we create an action potential, enough sodium chemically gated channels opened that it actually got all the way to minus 55, which is the threshold. That's the threshold that then will open up voltage gated channels on the axon then it will activate the action potential by activating the voltage gated channels on the axon. It gets positive here. This voltage gated channel that will be located in this area senses the positive from the cell body, causes its neighbor to be more positive, and lets sodium in there through a voltage gated channel. Triggers the next voltage gated channel, and so on, to the end of the axon. This occurs through voltage gated channels. So the action potential that we keep seeing this graph from, what it is is a measurement of the change in voltage at a given location on the axon. The voltage changes has to do with an ion coming in or out of the cell. The two ions we're talking about are sodium and potassium. To understand the graph, let's look at what's happening along the membrane with sodium voltage gated channels and potassium voltage gated channels and the sodium potassium pump. To start, recall that the cell body became positive, sufficient for the first part of the axon to reach minus 55. This opens the sodium voltage gated channel, allowing, it to en allowing sodium to enter. This makes the inside the area even more positive, ultimately reaching plus 30. The process of making the cell more positive is called depolarization. At plus 30, the sodium voltage gated channels close. Also at plus 30, the potassium voltage gated channel opens, allowing potassium out. Since potassium is a positive ion and it's leaving the cell, it helps the voltage to go back down, returning it to the normal negative state. The process of returning the cell to minus 70, its resting membrane potential, or bringing it back down is called repolarization. Finally, the cell is back to minus 70. It's at this point that the pump brings back potassium, 
two of them, bringing them back into the cell, and it sends out three sodium to restore the proper balance. So this region of the action potential of graph is known as hyperpolarization because it went past the normal resting membrane potential. So it's this dip that goes down, hyperpolarization phase is during the time that we're doing this rebalancing of sodium and potassium. So this dip area on the graph is the known as hyperpolarization, and this is when we have the sodium and potassium exchange taking place by the pump. When the cell body becomes positive enough for the first part of the axon to reach minus 55 millivolts, or threshold, then the sodium voltage-gated channels will open. Sodium enters the neuron. We see on the graph this as depolarization. This will trigger a neighbor sodium voltage-gated channel to open. In the first channel, at plus 30, that is the peak where the sodium voltage-gated channels close. But also at plus 30 is where our, our potassium voltage-gated channels open, and potassium exits the area, and this is called repolarization. While the sodium is entering during depolarization in the adjacent area, the first area is returning the ions back by the pump. At the same time, the second area is actually starting repolarization. The positive wave continues down the axon, opening sodium channels to become more positive, with the, followed by potassium channels open to the positive wave travels down the axon, followed by the repolarization in each segment by the potassium and the resetting by the pumps. So let's go through the steps of this action potential graph. To start, the sodium voltage gated channels are closed at the normal cell voltage of minus 70 millivolt. This is the resting membrane potential the normal voltage of the cell at rest. If the cell body gets positive enough to go from minus 70 to minus 55, it'll cause the first voltage-gated channel to open by reaching the threshold voltage. This starts the depolarization phase where sodium enters the cell, making it more positive, which you can see on the graph as the rapidly rising phase. At plus 30, the sodium channels close, so no more sodium can enter. But at this time, potassium channels, voltage-gated channels also open, bringing the cell more negative by the potassium leaving. This is known as repolarization. During this time, sodium channels are locked and in a state that they cannot reopen for a time. This repolarization phase is also known as a refractory period because the sodium channels are still locked and will not be opened. The bottom portion, where we go down, is where the pumps again restore the concentration gradient inside and out of the cell, sort of a resetting until it goes back to minus 70 millivolts again and the cell is ready to go again you will need to know the voltage of the open and closed states for the sodium and potassium voltage-gated channels. Sodium voltage-gated channels open at minus 55 and they close at plus 30. Potassium voltage-gated channels open at plus 30 but close again at minus 70. We can see this again where we have resting membrane potential where the sodium voltage-gated channels closed. During depolarization after threshold, the voltage-gated sodium channel is open and the red line becomes positive because sodium is entering the cell. That's known as depolarization. Then, during repolarization, the sodium voltage-gated channel is locked. It's known as the refractory period. But also during this time, potassium is open, which causes the cell to become more negative. I don't have a picture of the potassium. Only the images on the slide now are the state of the sodium channels. Once the 
potassium channel cause the repolarization bringing the voltage back down we can then have the voltage gated channels are closed but they can be ready to go again they are no longer locked after it's gone back to the rebalanced state at minus 70 at resting membrane potential and all the, the pumping has brought the sodium back out and the potassium back in so what a refractory period really means is it's closed and locked starting at plus 30. That's known as the absolute refractory period. This may differ from some of your textbooks who started clear over at the point of threshold. But the definition of an absolute refractory period is when the sodium voltage gated channels are closed and will not open. Finally, during this pump and resetting phase, which uses ATP to get three sodium out of the cell and two potassium back in, it is during this time that we have a relative refractory period, which means that sodium channel voltage gated channels really don't want to open, but if a strong enough stimulus were to arrive at that neuron, it could stimulate again. Absolute means it will not reopen but relative refractory means it can, but with a higher than 55 threshold. Then when you get back to minus 70 again, and the rebalance has taken place, then it can open at a normal phase and no longer is it in a refractory period. So we can see here a summary of the states of the sodium voltage gated channels as well as the potassium voltage gated channels. So when we talk about the progress down the axon, we have reached threshold, minus 55 along the axon, it became more positive, we're electrically stimulating the axon, the action potential, we have a series of them at each segment down the axon. And we finally get to the end, this will release chemicals called the neurotransmitter onto another cell. So the basic steps for neuron action is it gets a trigger onto the dendrites and cell body. That makes it more positive, which then causes the voltage gated channels along the axon to open in sequence, ultimately releasing neurotransmitters from the end. There are two ways that the travels. We've really been just talking about the continuous way where we have one voltage gated channel opening the next one, opening the next one in series down the axon. This is known as continuous propagation. However, there is saltatory propagation where we have myelin and one segment literally leapfrogs across the myelin to only activate the exposed section between myelin. So this is much more rapid and that is one of the benefits of myelin. So you definitely need to know the difference between continuous and saltatory propagation. So you should know the ions that determine the membrane potential being sodium and potassium you should know where their high concentration is. Sodium is high outside, potassium is high inside. You should know the types of channels. There are chemically gated channels and voltage gated channels. Each channel is unique to its own ion. So there's chemically gated sodium channels and chemically gated potassium channels. There are voltage gated sodium channels and voltage gated potassium channels. You should know where chemically gated channels are. They're on the cell body and dendrite. You should know where voltage gated channels are. They're on the axon. You should know the role of the membrane pumps. Pumping back in two potassium every time it pumps out three, three sodium using ATP. You should know about graded potentials. That means not quite up to threshold, but when it finally reaches threshold, you should know the parts of the action potential diagram as well as the voltage that opens sodium and potassium channels as well as closing sodium channels. You should know what an absolute refractory period is and a relative refractory period. And you should be able to describe the difference between continuous and saltatory propagation. For the synapse, we'll talk about the components here. The release of a neurotransmitter onto another cell, such as another neuron, muscle cell, or gland, is known as a synapse. 
The components are the end of the neuron and the axon terminal that releases a neurotransmitter onto the membrane or of a second cell. The components of a synapse start with the end of a neuron, the axon terminal. Inside these enlarged ends are bubbles filled with neurotransmitters called vesicles. There are many different kinds of neurotransmitters and each neuron releases one type. The neurotransmitter crosses the space called the synaptic cleft to reach the other side and to bind to a receptor on the membrane of another cell, usually the dendrite of a neuron, or it could be a muscle cell. When an action potential arrives at the axon terminal, it causes calcium to enter, which pushes these vesicles to the membrane, and once it touches, it opens up, and the neurotransmitter falls out and enters the cleft, crossing over to the postsynaptic membrane of the second cell. Once the neurotransmitter is bound to the receptor, it can't stay there endlessly stimulating the cell. The neurotransmitter is removed. It can just float away via diffusion, or it can be broken down by an enzyme, which is what happens to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. It most commonly is just taken back up into the axon terminal, and the process is called reuptake. Many types of narcotics block the removal of neurotransmitters to allow it to sustain action for longer periods. Many medications target this as well for specific neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are most commonly brought back to the axon terminal, either whole or in broken down pieces, to be reformed, as is in the case with acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. So for a synapse, you should know what's the presynaptic and postsynaptic components, as well as how a neurotransmitter is released, and then how it's removed or taken back up. Finally, we'll go through the different types of neurotransmitters. The action of neurotransmitters can be to excite a cell, meaning it's going to open up sodium channels and cause cell depolarization and cause an action potential, or it can inhibit a cell, causing the cell to go farther away from threshold and making it harder to reach an action potential. There are two main categories of neurotransmitters. The main group has some subclasses which we won't address, but just categorize them as small molecule ones that get released and then, via reuptake, get recycled to be released again. The other group on the right is technically known as a neuropeptide because they're large molecules, and once they're released, they stay out there until it degrades, so they actually stay out for a prolonged period of time, so they're more potent and longer lasting. Acetylcholine is the first neurotransmitter we'll go to. Its site of action occurs in the brain, but we also talked about it having action at the neuromuscular junction. In the brain, it is involved with our memory, and its pathology is associated with Alzheimer's disease. The area of the brain that utilizes a lot of acetylcholine is the hippocampus, and it's where our long-term memories are. The neuromuscular junction on the muscle cell is obviously where we activate a muscle when it's released from a neuron. Norepinephrine. This is a neurotransmitter that in the brain causes us to have feel good. It's a, one of our feel good neurotransmitters. However, too much norepinephrine can increase aggressive behavior. The sympathetic nervous system outside of the brain actually uses norepinephrine, known as noradrenaline. It's part of our flight or fight, so it's actually quite normal. It's not really about elevating mood or being aggressive. It's just about responding to danger. It's only within the brain in certain regions that it has an effect on how we feel and our mood, or in the cases of excessive amounts, increases of aggressive behavior. Amphetamines will cause us to release more norepinephrine in the brain. What can block the removal and cause this neurotransmitter to stay in the cleft for longer and having longer action would be something like cocaine or MAOIs, which is a type of antidepressants. Dopamine is another neurotransmitter that's involved in motor coordination. So its pathology in this orange color is associated with Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's disease have tremors, and there's a very specific part of the brain known as the substantia nigra, 
or it's part of our motor pathway. And this region utilizes a lot of dopamine. So when we don't have enough dopamine in that part of the brain, that is one of the problems associated with Parkinson's disease. And we can increase it by giving the patient L-DOPA. In the blue component, the dopamine in other parts of the brain actually is another feel-good neurotransmitter. It makes us feel satisfied. It makes us, when you've achieved a task and accomplished something, that you have a level of reward and satisfaction. So amphetamines also increase dopamine, just like they do for norepinephrine. Likewise, cocaine and MAOI inhibitors also block the removal, making us have a greater effectiveness of our dopamine. Serotonin, again with our feel-good neurotransmitter. Serotonin is associated with depression and other symptoms associated along with depression. Prozac is a drug used to specifically treat serotonin. Prozac blocks the removal of serotonin, making it more effective. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter that's involved in learning and memory. And so it's involved with learning new things and transmitting them into long-term memory. Glutamate is affected by alcohol and it causes impairment of learning and memory or putting what you've just learned into long-term memory. So if you're studying for this class, don't drink alcohol while you're doing so. GABA is our inhibitory neurotransmitter. And if somebody doesn't have enough GABA or the GABA levels are not high enough in certain parts of the brain, it might lead to somebody to be triggered more easily, such as occurs in somebody having an epileptic fit. So epilepsy is associated with not enough GABA, and so the, neuro, the neurons are too responsive. They will trigger at anything. Their resting membrane potential is a little too close to their threshold. Valium actually causes more GABA to be released, and it helps to bring down your resting membrane potential so to make it less hyper-responsive. Alcohol can also affect GABA, but only in the way of motor function. So if you see a person that's had a lot to drink in terms of alcohol, they may have lost a lot of their motor coordination, and this is due specifically to GABA. Now that same person, if they drank too much, back over here to glutamate, they not, might not remember what they did. So glutamate is affecting memory, and it's influenced by alcohol, but GABA affects motor coordination. Substance P is our first of those neuropeptides. It actually is released and it stays out until it degrades. And so substance P is associated with pain. It's also associated with vomiting. It's slow to build up. It's, it's so, it depends on what neurons are releasing it, but pain is probably the most commonly associated thing with substance P. So it's pain duration and intensity. Hot peppers, for instance, cause the release of substance P in the mouth, and that's why it has this long sustained release. Endorphins are other neuropeptide. They are released to inhibit substance P. And so endorphins can offset someone experiencing a great deal of pain. In other cases, people that exercise, that become almost addicted to exercise because of the intense exercise over time can actually cause an increase in endorphin levels, and these, this is known as the runner's high. So for the neurotransmitters, you should know the name of each one. You should know what each neurotransmitter does and the influence of drugs, medications, or alcohol on them as well as pathologies for certain specific neurotransmitters. We talked about Alzheimer's disease, we talked about depression, aggression, as well as Parkinson's disease.